Welcome everyone to this webinar on using arts data from the Adolescent Brain Cognitive Development Study hosted by NADAC, the National Archive of Data on Arts and Culture. I'm Anya Ovchinikova, the NADAC Project Manager. Allow me to also introduce uh, Dr. Lynette Holter, NADAC's Director. We both are delighted to have you all here with us today uh, for this webinar. Uh, I would like to say a few words about our archive. Uh, NADAC facilitates access to data on the arts and on the arts uh, value and impact for individuals and communities. Um, uh, funding for NADAC is generously provided by the National Endowment for the Arts. And thanks to the NEA support, researchers and policy makers uh, and the general public can all obtain data from NADAC uh, entirely free of charge. Currently, there are 169 studies in NADAC. Uh, that's uh, over 90,000 arts-related variables and more than 1,000 citations to data-related publications. Um, and now I would like to extend a warm welcome to Sunil Iyengar, Director of the Office of Research and Analysis at the National Endowment for the Arts, who will share a few opening remarks and introduce our presenters. Yes, thank you very much, Anya. And thank you everyone to jo who's joined us today. Um, we look forward to a really exciting uh, presentation and discussion. And do please uh, enter any questions in the chat as they emerge. Um, <clears throat> so again, I'm Sunil Iyengar, Director of uh, Research, as it says here at the National Endowment for the Arts. And I have to say, ever since we established NADAC, or the National Archive of Data on Arts and Culture, several years ago, um, you know, it's grown very steadily and accumulated a lot of great, uh, largely, I would say, cultural economics kind of data. A um, lot of great arts data sets, qualitative, quantitative. Um, but I would say the majority of data sets in there uh, are really policy-related data having to do with, you know, oftentimes from federal data partners or others. Um, and a lot of variables that I know of people who study, particularly ec econometrics and those kinds of aspects of the arts tend to delve into. Um, what we have today is something quite different. I'm very glad we can bring it to the forefront. Um, one of the other data sets we link to through NADAC is the one we're going to be talking about today, having to do with the Adolescent Brain Cognitive Development Study, which is a fantastic example, I think, of, um, of, of government investment in a longitudinal data collection uh, around, in this case, as of course, teenagers and as they progress into adoles uh, older adolescence and uh, young adulthood. And so um, we, we're glad to feature this for a couple of reasons. Um, one is, of course, the data themselves are very rich uh, and have, as you learn, arts variables in them to, to learn about and how that relates to the study. Uh, but also because um, this taps into a growing area of research investment for the NEA and its federal partners, for example, the National Institutes of Health, specifically on the arts and music in particular as it relates to childhood development and, and in fact, um, uh, adolescent development and, and growth, and I would say human development more broadly, and health and well-being. So um, if people are interested in learning more about some of the NEAs and, and our partners' uh, most recent uh, investments in the space around music and health in particular, one of the places you can go is another resource center we have called the Sound Health Network, which is maintained at the University of California, San Francisco. San Francisco. And if you go there, uh, through their website, you'll learn a lot more. And you can get there through arts.gov too. Uh, you can learn a lot more about not only some of our research, but other opportunities such as this to engage with data and part practitioners at this intersection of arts and health. Um, so without further ado, I'll just introduce, if you can go to the next slide, our speakers. Um, and first of all, I'm really proud to have Dr. Gaia Dowling here. Uh, she was the one who introduced the NEA to the possibility of becoming a federal partner on the ABCD study, and we're glad to participate in that respect. Um, and she'll talk about the ABCD. Uh, Dr. Dowling, uh, it's been really a pleasure to work, to follow how she's uh, ma managed and coordinated the stu this massive study uh, at the federal level. Um, and she's, uh, in fact, the director of the ABCD uh, program. Uh, she's served, she has previously served as a, as a deputy director of the Office of Science 
policy and uh, engagement, education and communications at the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute and the Chief of Science Policy at the National Institute on Drug Abuse. And I should have said, this is a study that is out of the National Institute on Drug Abuse. That's where Gaia works um, as part of the National Institute of Health. Um, she's had, I, I realized she's had a lot of experience elsewhere at NIH. I just mentioned one of the other institutes, but she's also worked at uh, previously at the National Institute of Mental Health um, and indeed at the uh, work that I believe the national, um, uh, sorry, working at research on the Parkinson's Institute prior to joining NIH and working also at the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke. So a very long and illustrious ped pedigree. I'll skip over that, but looking forward to that, uh, hearing you talk about this, Gaia. And um, of course, Dr. John Iverson, who's I think one of the leading lights in research on the arts and childhood development. Um, we're very proud to invest in some of his work as part of an NEA research grant, research labs program, excuse me, uh, sorry, labs grant. Um, and he's he's now, uh, he's a cognitive neuroscientist at McMaster University, and of course studies music in the brain. Um, he, of course, as you'll hear, taps into the ABCD study to good effect. Um, and he's also directed something called the Symphony Project, S-I-M-P-H-O-N-Y, and co-directs the early project, E-A-R-L-I. -E uh, both are um, sort of studies that, longitudinal studies having to do with uh, early childhood mus uh, and music, uh, music training. Um, I should say that at McMaster Institute, and he, you know, he previously was at um, UCSD, uh, where that work was is being done. But he's he, at McMaster. He's an associate professor in the Department of Psychology, Neuroscience, and Behavior. But he's also a member of the McMaster Institute for Music and the Mind and the Live Lab, which is a really cool lab. Uh, just to note that it's it's I think the world's first kind of concert hall setting for neuroscience research. Uh, some of you may know about that work. Um, so anyway. Lots of great stuff here to hear about, but in particular, we're focusing on the ABCD study and related data about the arts and how researchers can get engaged with it. So thank you very much. Would you like to go uh, next, Gaia? Yes. Great. Well, thank you for inviting me to speak today and um, for that kind introduction. I'm going to give an overview of the Adolescent Brain Cognitive Development Study, and then John will delve deeper into the specific measures that may be of most interest to this group. <clears throat> so the ABCD study is a longitudinal study of close to 12,000 kids that were enrolled when they were 9 to 10 years old, and that was in between 2016 and 2018 and are being followed over time through adolescence into early adulthood. And it's looking at a number of different factors that we believe will in, are influencing brain development trajectories and other outcomes. So when we started the study, we had some specific research objectives in mind, which kind of uh, framed what uh, types of data we would end up collecting. So one of the primary objectives was to describe these individual developmental trajectories, looking at brain, cognition, emotion, academic development, and the factors that affect them. We were hoping that out of this, we may be able to develop national standards of healthy brain development, something akin to the height and weight um, growth charts that you see at the pediatrician's office <clears throat> that can be um, looked at against for youth that have, are having problems. <clears throat> we're also interested in looking at the roles and interactions of genes in the environment on development. And here's a, a listing of a few things that we are looking at, but there are many more. Um, things like physical activity, sleep, screen time, sports injuries. And like I said, John will talk about some of the arts measures that we have. <clears throat> Very important to this study was also to understand the factors that influence the onset course and severity of mental illness and the relationship between mental health and substance use, <clears throat> as well as understanding um, how different substances affect de developmental outcomes. So from the National Institute on Drug Abuse perspective, these are really um, essential questions that you can only answer if you have a large cohort and you start looking at them prior to any of these occurring. So the goal with starting when they were nine and 10 years old <clears throat> is that they were hopefully not using substances yet, Mental health um, problems tend to emerge during adolescence, so ho hopefully it would be before that. So we could get a good picture of the child prior to these things happening, and then 
if they transition to mental health problems or substance use, then be able to see the impact on the brain and other developmental trajectories. So how do we do this? <clears throat> we recruited, like I said, close to 12,000 youth and a caregiver from 21 research sites across the country. So you can see them here. We have, um, in addition to the 21 research sites, we have a coordinating center and a data analysis center at the University of California in San Diego. <clears throat> Most of the recruitment was done using a school-based strategy. So each site was uh, received a list of schools in, the, in a catchment area around their site. Um, and, and they would invite all of the kids at the time were fourth and fifth grade to come and participate in the study. And then people would self-select to join the study. And through that method, we um, were able to recruit about 10,000 kids. Um, one of the reasons we did it that way was to be able to, over the two years that we were doing enrollment, adjust which schools we were um, we were talking to to ensure that we had a diverse cohort. Because even though this study is not nationally representative, it does reflect the demographics of the country. And I'll get to that in a second. In addition to the school-based recruitment, we wanted to, because of this interest in looking at the genes and environment particularly, we wanted to have a subset of the cohort that were kids of multiple births, so twins and triplets. So we did um, worked with twin registries in four states in Missouri, Minnesota, Colorado, and Virginia um, to enroll uh, twins and triplets. And we have about 2000 of those uh, families in the study. So in terms of demographics, um, we have close to 50% bo um, boys and girls sex assigned at birth. We had every site had a target for the racial and ethnic makeup as what that would roll into a full cohort that reflected the demographics of the country based on the American Community Survey. So you can see here that we have about 50% white, about 15% black, about 20% Hispanic, which is very similar to what we see in the American Community Survey. So I'm going to give a very high level overview of all of the information that is available, all of the assessment domains um, that we have in the study. It would take more than a couple of hours to go through all of them, but I wanted to give you a flavor of what we're including. So we have questions about physical health. This talks about things like sleep and pubertal development. We uh, take blood pressure, anthropometrics, those kinds of things in the physical health domain. We have quite an extensive um, assessment protocol for mental health, where we both ask about the youth to talk about themselves, the caregiver to talk about the youth, and the caregiver to give information on the family. And this ranges from everything from depression, anxiety, uh, conduct disorder, ADHD, all of that is captured in the mental health domain. Then we have a substance use domain, where we begin by just asking them if they've heard of substances, and if they have, then we delve deeper into how, a, whether they're using, and, and a lot of details about their use of specific substances. Then we have a really important category, which is culture and environment. And this asks about essentially the world that they live in from their perspective. So we get information on their, their neighborhood, on their schools, on their family environment. Um, we have questions about discrimination and about acculturation so, so that we can get a more holistic sense of, of the youth in the study. Then we have a neurocognitive battery. So we have a number of cognition tasks um, that are focused on learning and memory, um, attention, impulsivity. We also have neuroimaging. We are a brain development study. So we have both structural and functional MRI. And in the functional, we have both resting state and task-based MRI. Then we collect some biospecimens. Um, from these, we get uh, pubertal hormones. We've extracted DNA, so we can, we've done genotyping of, of the youth in the study. And we've collected um, blood to look at things like hemoglobin A1C, mm -hmm. and cholesterol levels in our youth. And then some about two years into the study, we started to have Fitbits and go out to each of the youth for about three weeks a year. Um, to collect objective information on um, activity as well as uh, sleep. <clears throat> and then lastly, oh, before I get to geocoded data, then COVID-19 hit. So we, we started 2016 to 2018 before the pandemic. When the pandemic hit, 
you know, there was, of course, a lot of disruption as there was for everybody, but we recognized that it would be really important to understand the experiences that the youth were having during the pandemic. Um, so things like uh, loss of uh, employment, um, food insecurity, the schools closing, all of that information, because any long-term outcomes that we're going to be looked at should be looked at through that lens. And then the last thing I want to talk about is the geocoded data. So we use um, residential history derived data to link to external data sets to better understand, again, the environment in which the youth are living. So this is not individual level data. It is in the sense that it's based on where they live, but it's not about them necessarily, but it is about the environment around them. So we can get information like population density, uh, road traffic, um, air pollution, um, green space. We also have things like amenities. So are there um, arts organizations around them, um, things like residential segregation. And we get information about the schools that the kids are actually in. So we understand the context in, with, in which they are growing. So the goal was to do that pretty extensive um, protocol starting when they were nine and 10 and to repeat it every other year. And then in the intervening year, we ask a much smaller um, set of questions. We don't have any brain imaging, but we want to understand what's happened to them in the past in the past year. And then every six months, we have a phone touch in where we um, talk briefly, uh, you know, maintain contact, and ask some questions about initiation of substance use, for example. And the plan has been and is now to follow them for a total of 10 years of assessments. So starting when they're nine and 10, eating, ending when they're 18 to 19 uh, years old. And one of the most important things, the most exciting things um, for me at NIDA is that we make this data available to the scientific community very rapidly. So our first data release was in 2018 when we had only enrolled about half the cohort. Um, and we've made it, we've released the data annually ever since. And it's being released through the NIMH data archive right now, which you can get access through um, through NDA um, once you have a data use certification to be able to access the data. So to date, this is the data that's available. We have fast track neuroimaging data that is continuously coming out. And then annually we release all of this data basically that I explained uh, earlier. And in the data set right now, we have the full cohort data for the baseline one, two, and three year follow up data. So that is all available right now. Um, the last thing I want to mention before I turn it over to John is that we are really excited about the number of different types of um, analyses that are being done with ABCD data, certainly far more than we had ever uh, imagined when we started the study. And we've, we're going to have a meeting in March called the ABCD Insights and Innovations Meeting that will showcase some of this research. So I, um, if you are doing analysis in this space, we are accepting submissions for abstracts for the meeting. Um, and if you're not just interested in what we're finding in the ABCD study, please join us on March 4th and 5th in 2024. And with that, I will turn it over to John. Thanks so much, Gaia. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Let me turn on my video. So appreciate the invitation. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna talk a little bit more specifically about arts measures in ABCD and what we've been doing that. Uh, to start, I just wanted to acknowledge my collaborators and the generous funding of NIH and the NEA. So some of the questions that have really interested our group are, how can arts experiences be best used to enhance development of each individual? How can arts experience be best used to promote health and address developmental disorders? And also, how can the neuroscience research provide a foundation for rational approaches to how we integrate arts into development. So as Gaia has um, talked about, we're at a time of great opportunity because of studies like ABCD, which are large scale studies of neurodevelopmental trajectories. Um, and as she mentioned, this is giving us you know, the potential to define growth curves of the brain and then also understand how uh, different experiences might affect those. So this is, um, 
cross-sectional data from a previous study, um, uh, cross-sectional data, which means each uh, point is a single individual from age two to 22. Um, just broad measures of cortical area, cortical thickness of the brain. Um, what ABCD enables us to do is to take each of these points and then track a trajectory over time and see you know, whether individuals keep on with the mean, um, go higher, lower, and so forth, and what factors might affect those trajectories. So uh, our larger objectives are to describe the relationship between music engagement and brain and behavioral developmental tra trajectories in childhood and adolescence. Um, and to do that, we've leveraged um, several studies, um, Pling, which was a predecessor of ABCD, and then of course, ABCD, which have very rich characterization of brain, behavior, demographics, and genetics. Um, and my personal crusade has been to, to really uh, see this as a as a great resource. Um, you know, we're not at a at a point in our in our uh, sort of development of science funding that we're about to um, you know fund ten year studies of tens of thousands of kids about arts alone, right? Um, but the fact that these studies are going on means that we can really piggyback on them and leverage them um, to ask questions about arts. And so one of my kind of, you know, crusades has been to try to enrich these studies with as much detail on music and arts phenotypes as possible uh, to create really a long-term resource for the whole field. Um, and so this, this kind of time span has been spanned by several studies, including Pling, which is um, really the direct predecessor to ABCD, and then ABCD, uh, and as well as some small scale studies uh, funded by NEA, where we're looking at younger, younger children and actual direct uh, interventions in contrast to these other studies like ABCD, which are observational. So what about arts experience in ABCD? Um, it's captured largely as part of something called the activities questionnaire, um, which is a, a pretty detailed questionnaire given to parents, uh, which includes detailed information about participation in a wide range of activities. Um, sports, of course, uh, many different sports, but also performance uh, in arts, music, dance, drama, visual, and crafts. Um, and specifically, this is active engagement. Um, so this is learning uh, lessons, playing in bands, um, creating art. Uh, and for each of these activities, there are detailed measures of the context in which it is happening, and as well as the intensity uh, of the involvement. And this is part of the annual questionnaire that Gaia mentioned. And uh, in addition, there's a little bit of information about listening to music as well as reading. Um, and uh, sort of one of my triumphs was to add a couple of questions to uh, the ABCD study about music listening, not only the amount, uh, which is, is high and getting higher as you can imagine, but also a few questions about how um, the participants use music in their everyday life, whether it's for motion regulation or while studying. Um, so uh, one, you know, really nice thing about the study is that music uh, engagement is highly represented. And here's a plot uh, from the baseline data of the percent of participants endorsing each of these different activities. Uh, and you can see music is the highest. And this is this pattern has remained um, quite stable uh, throughout the study. So in, in the baseline, it was about almost 40 percent with some kind of music involvement. Um, and because of this rich uh, range of, of different measures and different activities, we can start to look at things like the correlation between participation in different activities. So this, this is a correlation matrix um, where the redness uh, indicates activities that are correlated. So you can look at the row and column. Um, and I just wanna give you an impression here, but uh, this has been clustered into activities that tend to to cohere together. Um, so you see, for example, traditional uh, sporting like baseball, basketball, and football. Now the arts activities are spread around uh, in, in this, this matrix. Um, and, and music, you can see here, correlates with not only arts, but, but many other sports as well. Uh, so this is just a, a broad overview. More specifically, we can look at intensity and context. And I'm focusing on music because that's my own personal interest. But again, we have this information for uh, dance, visual arts, drama, and so forth. Um, we can look at the age started. Um, we can look at how over the different time points, um, in the latest data, there's actually um, five different time points um, of 
for example, the intensity of hours per week um, of engagement. We see how that is growing over time. Um, we can keep track of the cumulative hours of music engagement um, as children age. We can look at the context in which it is um, engaged in, so school, um, outside school, private lessons, and self-study. And finally, uh, this newer questions I mentioned about music listening, um, here is an example from years uh, three and four. Year three was when this question was first started being asked when kids were about 13, um, how uh, you know we can actually see that a lot of kids listen to music while studying and that amount is growing as we see by the, the black outlined bars from year four. Um, just very quickly go through a few um, results. I, I would not call any of these conclusive, but just to give you an example of how we might use the arts uh, data in ABCD to get at other interesting questions in behavior, brain, and relating to genes and environment. Um, so uh, this is kind of a, a busy figure, but we can look at associations between activities engagement uh, with other measures such as global cognition. Um, so, for example, this, this matrix here shows the regression coefficients between arts, music, soccer, and sports uh, with some general cognitive measures like fluid and crystallized intelligence and a couple of um, uh, genetic, quote-unquote, risk scores for IQ and educational attainment. Um, and we, we see an interesting pattern that um, arts and music particularly are particularly highly correlated um, with crystallized intelligence and fluid intelligence as well. Um, the fact that soccer and sports are blue means there is a negative correlation, but uh, you notice with these um, asterisks that indicates the statistical significance. Um, so in fact, while these look kind of opposite, they're not significant. So it's not, not we can't make a really clear dichotomous conclusion about any of this. Um, and, and this is purely correlational data as well. So we don't know necessarily the direction of the influences. Um, but to give you a sense of, of the strength of the impact is also very important to look at. Um, arts and music accounted for about um, between one and 2% of these cognitive variables. So uh, it's, it's always important to keep that kind of in context. Um, we can also look at arts and as a, in the context of um, brain development. So uh, we can do surface-based analysis of relative differences in local cortical surface area. So the cortex is, you can think of as like a big sheet and it's growing, but different regions grow and expand differential rates. So by looking at that, we can tell something about um, individual differences in development. So for example, um, the, the regions of cortex in yellow here are regions that are most where their area is most highly correlated with the amount of music that children have been engaged in. Um, and so their regions in the temporal parietal junction and auditory cortex um, and motor and frontal areas. And then we can compare those to similar maps that have been made for other, other phenotypes. Um, and finally, a, a recent study that I was involved in looked at heritability and associations of music and language and executive function. Um, and this really leverages uh, what Guy mentioned, the, the twin subset uh, in ABCD, where we can really look at these differences in genetic and environmental impacts, as well as the larger subset where we have all this information about music and arts and language and executive function. Um, and briefly, uh, music exposure. So just merely having the experience of engaging in music had the highest correlation with um, language, executive function, and working memory specific measures. Um, and that kind of compares to other visual arts and so forth. Um, but we see that all of all of these activities had positive effects on these these uh, cognitive outcome variables. Um, and we also found through the the twin studies that shared environment accounts more for music engagement than genetics. So um, finally, uh, kind of an ongoing goal is to further enhance the music phenotypes in the ABCs study by developing an online musicality test battery that we hope. Uh, might be accepted to be included as an optional part of the study to get more fine-grained information about um, musical phenotypes. Uh, so in conclusion, it's a very rich resource. Um, it's 
you know, musically enha enhanced, enhanced with arts measures. Um, and we have other related projects, but really uh, ABCD is, is the one we're most excited about right now. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. And we're gonna see if we have any questions from the audience. We do have one. This one is for John. Uh, well, actually, it's probably for either of you. But um, with regard to music, are the measures uh, measuring whether they're listening to music and the different genres? Or are they measuring playing an instrument or composing pieces? Can you be a little bit more specific about what the measures are? Of course. Um, so the most of the measures I spoke about in the sports activity, those are active engagement. So that's playing a musical instrument, uh, singing. Um, I don't believe there's a question at the moment about composition, um, the writing music. So that's a very interesting point. Um, and, but there are a few measures um, of listening as well. Um, but the bulk of what I showed was actually ac active engagement in making music. Yeah, and I would just add that um, John and I know that um, on the study team, the ABCD study team, the people revising those questions, we're actually interested in also being very inclusive in the types of musical instruments, uh, in, you know, referenced. If I recall, the list, the questionnaire has a, really a gamut of different types of instruments, and really getting into, um, you know, culturally specific kinds of groups that may play different types of instruments that may not be in the traditional, say, Western canon of musical instruments. So. It's it's pretty broad list um, and very that gives a lot of richness also to the data. Yeah, it's very it's very rich. It includes DJ, electronica, um, other types of engagement. This is another follow up question about the the music questions, um, which is: Is there any information about the quality of music or, or arts instruction and experiences, or is it just um, that they've had these experiences? Yeah, another wonderful question. Um, as far as I know, it's just they've had these experiences. Um, we don't have um, independent data about the quality, uh, however you might measure that. Um, the, the only thing we do have is, is some measurement of the site at which the activity occurred, um, whether it's within school or outside of school and in private lessons. Um, and there's some very interesting patterns there, as you might expect. Um, we found that uh, as time goes on, uh, more and more students are getting their music um, sort of engagement in schools. Um, and then there's, there's sort of a negative correlation also between in school and private lessons as well. And if I could just um, add to that, you know, one of the things I didn't mention is that, you know, ABCD set out to look at a wide variety of um, influences on development which necessarily meant that we could only do it at a high level, right? There, if we were to go in depth in any particular area, it would the kids would never come back. It would be way too much for them to handle. Um, but what we hope is yeah. that studies like the analyses that John's doing will, you know, lead people to do more specific studies where they can drill deeper into some of those questions. So really using ABCD as a launching point to um, explore some of those in greater detail. Thank yeah. you. That's actually a perfect lead into the next question, which is, um, are there any data in the ABCD that relate to trauma experiences or exposure um, or risk risk taking behavior? Yes, um, quite a lot, actually. So we um, collect information from the parents when they were younger from the parents about traumatic events. And as the youth have gotten older, we've transitioned to asking them about them. And they range from um, you know, moving, you know, changing schools to losing a parent to um, abuse, physical abuse. So we do collect quite a bit of that information. And then with respect to risk taking, um, absolutely. Um, I'm from the National Institute on Drug Abuse. So that's very important for what we are interested in. Um, so we do have a lot of information about, like I mentioned, substances, um, but also, you know, now the kids are now about 15, 16 years old. So we're getting information about driving and the circumstances around that. Um, as they get, you know, as they mature, we're also asking questions about um, safe sex and, you know, how they're approaching romantic relationships. So that will be included in the data set moving forward. Great. <clears throat> Lots more questions coming in. So I'm just going to kind of keep moving on. Um, 
This one I think is specifically for John um, asking, do most of your analyses control for SES? Thanks. Yeah, that, I made, I admitted that slide uh, in, in my haste, I suppose. Um, yes, they absolutely do control for SES. Um, there, there's quite a lot of demographic information in the ABCD study. Um, I think traditional measures like household income and uh, parental education, for example. Um, there's also um, information about um, you know other aspects of of the environment in which uh, children are growing. I did want to mention, um, this is something Gaia mentioned about this external data linkages, and it's not something I've looked into yet, um, but I noticed that each child does have an identifier connecting them to a school and a district. Um, and I'm not sure uh, exactly what information that would, would enable one to link to, but potentially, as uh, regarding the question earlier, um, you might be able to get some idea from the district, for example, of how much that district is spending on arts education. Um, so it is potentially, uh, you know, one way to get at that question of quality or access. Yeah, that is something that we are interested in broadly in terms of, you know, the kinds of programs that are involved in schools. We don't currently link to those data sets, but if there are data sets that anyone is aware of that we could link to, please let me know because we are, um, you know, as Sunil mentioned, we continually monitor the protocol and the data that's being included and make changes as we go. Could you talk a little bit more about um, what your plans are for the future of the study? I know that you mentioned that it was a 10 year um, study, but yeah. what are what are your plans and how can people access the data and things like that? Great question. Um, so yes, the, the study was initially set out to be a 10 year study. However, we know that the brain isn't done developing at 18 and 19. We know that mental health problems and substance use are just emerging at the ages that our kids are going to be at the end of this 10 years. So we definitely want to continue the study and um, and continue to follow these youth really through the 20s and hopefully even beyond. Uh, the question is funding. So we're still you know trying to determine how we're going to support it. It's quite because it's a brain imaging study, it's quite big and quite expensive. Um, but we think that there will be ways that we can extend the life of the studies. So um, we're in the process right now of collecting information about what could be included in a continuation of the study um, and, and are hoping that we will be able to do that. Um, with respect to accessing the data, um, it's all available currently through the NIMH data archive. So I can put um, some links in the chat for how to get there. Um, it, it's relatively easy to gain access. You, you, your institution as well as yourself need to sign a data use certification, which ensures that you are going to, you know, have the right security. You're going to, um, you know, take care of the data. Essentially, you're not going to try to identify anybody. Um, you're going to use the data responsibly. If that, when that's signed off on by you and your institution, it goes through a review process, and then you get access to the data. And it needs to be um, renewed annually. Um, but, you know, the data is constantly being refreshed. And so it, it's it's a great opportunity to be able to look at that data. Great. I'm seeing lots of excitement in the questions <laughs> that are coming in. Um, uh, another question is um, whether there are findings associated with other art forms like drama um, and if that work hasn't been done. Um, well, sorry. Um, you already answered how to access the data. So um, you don't have to answer that. Part. And I'll just put a plug in there that if people want to, I think that's an underutilized aspect of the great work here in, with ABCD is for the other art forms. We'd love to see something approaching the rigor and uh, depth that John has managed to achieve with the music questions and understanding those relationships to other outcomes. I mean, it'd be great to see that for the other art forms that are represented by the ABCD and maybe even engage in conversations about, can they be expanded in any way? Thanks. But it's like you guys are reading Agreed. these you questions know, I, too. I, I don't think... Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> uh, I, I don't mean to, you know, not, not making any implications about the, you know, relative importance of different arts. Uh, it just happens to be um, that my kind of path has led me to, to, to an interest in music. Um, but all that data is there, and I'd, I'd be actually very happy to, to talk about looking at in more detail the other arts. That leads um, 
very directly into another question, which is um, how can people think about maybe collaborating with someone who has used these data or um, finding someone who might be interested in looking at some of the other art forms? So if, you, if you're interested in learning um, more about the study, just Well, personally, I'm, I'm certainly interested, um, but maybe I have I was just going to say that if you're interested in, in learning more about the data on our website, we actually have um, listings of all the work group members that are part of the consortium that are developing the protocol. And, and so you can you know reach out to any of the sites that are doing this work and see if there's interest. Um, but like I said, like John was just about to say, he seems to be very interested in the data as well. Dan, would you like to add to what Gaia just said? Yeah, sorry. Um, I just wanted to say I'm certainly interested and would be happy to, you know, serve as a guide for anyone who's, uh, you know, interested in learning more about that. Um, we have a question specifically about using the data and then another uh, two, a set of questions about the data that are in there for the parents. Um, so in terms of using the data, this is a pretty specific question. Um, someone writes in that they are, uh, they're in the process of getting access to it, um, but they're wondering if you have any um, insights or tips for using some of the um, imaging data because it's so large. Yeah, no, that's also a great question. And it's been a challenge that we've been um, trying to address for some time. And, you know, given that we're, it's a longitudinal study, the amount of data is just growing exponentially. Um, so right now we're in a little bit of a transition in that we had developed a, an application called the Data Exploration and Analysis Portal that would help um, people who aren't as familiar with brain imaging data to be able to analyze it relatively easily. Unfortunately, um, DEEP had to be taken down this year, but in next year we're planning on transitioning the data archive um, to a new data sharing platform, which will have a lot more tools available for how to analyze the data. So I will definitely keep this group in, in um, aware of those transitions as they happen. Um, but yes, so th that's one thing. Then there's also an ABCD GitHub that has some resources that people can use for how to analyze the data. And I can make that um, link available as well. Great, thank you. Um, John, did you wanna add something? And if I could just add, uh, could I add also there's there's a very nice source of yeah I'm trying to speak hopefully you can hear me um, there's a very nice resource of tabulated imaging data so you don't actually have to go through all of the raw scans um, there's tabulated data about various anatomical aspects of the imaging great um Back to uh, questions about the questions. So do the demographic data for the parents include information about veteran or military status or disabilities or the, um, and or the level of arts participation of the parents themselves um, or the home environment as a whole? Is that any of that being collected? So I can answer the general questions that um, yes, we do have information about the parents in terms of military service. Um, and disabilities. Um, we don't have information, I don't think, about the parents' use of, of um, musical instruments. What was the other piece? I think I missed part of the question. Uh, disability status or veteran status? Yeah, we and we do have that information. And in terms of the home environment, we do have um, information in terms of relationships. So is there conflict in the family? Um, you know, what is the you know, is it, are, are there are do the parents or other family members have substance use problems, mental health problems? All of that information is also included in the data set. Great. Um. Oh, here's a good methodological question. Um, what has your retention rate been um, of your original sample? Great question. Um, we've done an incredible job, and by we, I mean all of the research sites and their RAs really have done an incredible job uh, retaining our, our cohorts. So our retention rate is about 96% uh, of participants have remained in the study to date. And we're actually, well, 
you know, three and a half, four years of data have been released, we're on our seventh um, data, or eight, actually eighth data collection wave right now. So the kids are 16, 17 years old. Um, not, and by retention, I mean that they have not formally withdrawn from the study. For us, if a, par if a participant has to miss a year because of whatever circumstances are in their lives, we will bring them in the next year. And so those people we don't consider lost uh, to follow up. But what happens is that in at any given year, we may have only 90% of the cohort that fin completes those assessments. But for the most part, um, our sites have done an amazing job of retaining the cohort. That is very impressive. Um, someone else asked how the genotyping data are being used. So I can tell you that um, in, in a lot of different ways, it's kind of hard to answer some of these questions with ABCD because we make the data available to the scientific community that people are using them in, in many different ways. Um, John can, can speak to the work he's done with polygenic risk scores. Um, but there are a lot of people who are looking at some of the differences between ge the genetics and, and the environment in which the kids are looking at living in with respect to a number of different variables because we do have so much in the data set. Great. This, Don, this, isn't, related, to this, this isn't related to genotyping necessarily, but I, I did want to call out, um, I know we didn't express, uh, talk about explicitly, but uh, as it relates to the arts, but um, one of the things that the study is kind of known for, I think, is putting on the map a lot of the research, cutting re edge research on screen time. And that's been something that's really been interesting to watch. And the, I don't have, know enough about the minutiae to be able to, you know, recount it. But um, there's a lot in there that, that has been, has made the literature and, in fact, national news um, about what this study has found about the risks and benefits. Um, and, and I think that's the dimension, certainly, of arts participation and arts engagement we're all interested in as well. So I've been just kind of from the sidelines, hoping that we can get to a point where we can understand, have a better array of kinds of, maybe we have some of those questions, but get at that, some of that information about the, that as a variable engagement through screens and media and, and arts cre content creation, et cetera. Um, so I know there's some, there's some work on that there, but I, that's another area I'd love to see strengthened by the yes. research community. Screen time is always a challenge. I mean, obviously it's a huge part of their lives. So we are definitely collecting information about how much time they spend on different, you know, different activities on online or on their phones uh, in social media. And over the years, as they've gotten older, we've increased um, the questions that we ask um, and have to change things because platforms change, you know, the way kids are using social media change. Um, but we are trying to incorporate as much of that as we can. And I'll actually also give put a link in um, for an infographic that we generated last year that highlights some of the screen time results um, in case you're in interested. We have one on screen time and one on sleep, and we will soon be coming out with another one on um, the impacts of the pandemic on the youth in our study. Fabulous. It looks like somebody is interested in this very thing because just as you were starting to talk, Sunil, a question came in about um, measures of social media usage, you've answered that, but um, they're also asking about measures of the use of things like AI generators, like MidJourney or ChatGPT. Are those in there as well? Not yet, <laughs> but, <laughs> but it seems like it may be one that we have to add for the next, the next wave of data collection. So this is what I mean. It, there's always something new that we have to try and incorporate in the future. Soon your, your survey is going to be five or six hours long. No. <laughs> yeah, one of the things that we're hoping to do if we're able to get extended funding is to do more of our questionnaires online so that we're not having them come in for 10 hours to, to do this. You know, they can come in, do the imaging, and then do the rest of their the uh, surveys on their own. Uh, hopefully that will make it a little bit easier on them. <laughs> definitely reduces respondent burden. While you're getting to the questions, Lynn, I have to say, I, from my vantage again, I think the study sponsors have been really uh, uh, thoughtful about also engaging the research participants. So I know it just sounds like, oh, bring them in for 10 hours. But in fact, there's been some even artwork that's been generated by these participants and has been, well, has been kind of opportunities to create art. I know there was a magazine a few years ago that we also contributed to that 
focused on child art uh, that was made during this process and kind of uh, as part of the community engagement piece of this. So that was kind of nice to see that it wasn't strictly clinical, if you will. Yeah, you know, and it gets back to the retention question. I think this is why um, participants have stayed with us for so long is because there really is a sense of community at a lot of these sites. They do um, ice skating parties and, you know, different types of activities to kind of bring them together. And since a lot of the kids were, most of the kids were enrolled through schools, they they know they have classmates that are also part of the studies. So it creates a nice environment. And, and one of the things that they did, particularly when they were younger, is they would have um, different brain games. Like they could asking people to draw, you know, what their image of a brain. I think I had that on one of my slides was a brain drawn by a participant. Um, they can make a hat, they can make a neuron. So there, there, there are all kinds of these types of creative activities that we provide for them at the sites to make it more interesting and engaging for them. That is so cool. I want to be young again so I can be a participant. <laughs> um, I think we have time for two or three more quick questions. So, um, and there are more questions in the Q&A box. So, um, are there any tools available that you can share with evaluators who are interested in measuring similar items? I'm sorry, say that again. Um, are there any tools available that you could share with evaluators who are interested in measuring similar items? Yeah, so the protocol that we have, and we don't have it on the website because we don't want the kids to see it before they come into the visit, but they're all available. You can contact the um, ABCD Coordinating Center and they're happy to share any of the protocols that we use. Fabulous. Um, another uh, technical question, um, does the ABCD uh, store the brain imaging data using the Amazon storage web service? This person read something like that on the website and wanted to clarify whether that was true. <laughs> so the uh, NIMH Data Archive does um, store data in AWS. Um, and when we transition the to the new data sharing platform, we, we're, we're not sure if we're gonna stick with that because there are egress charges for downloading the data. And as the data gets bigger, that gets more difficult. Um, so we're looking into various options to make that data available in the future. As a data archive, ICPSR hears you on those things. <laughs> um, finally, uh, okay, I lied. Two more quick questions. Um, what type of physical health um, issues are monitored? So we get um, information on a kind of a medical history and a developmental history from the that the parents give us on the youth. So we every year we get information about whether they have new diagnoses. And, and it ranges from you know, asthma to um, diabetes to a number of different conditions. Um, in addition to that, we are collecting data on, uh, um, we're collecting blood so that we can look at things like cholesterol, diabetes, um, anemia, and that data is included in the data set as well. Um, so th there are some that can be kind of gathered from the medical history. One of the things that we don't have yet that we're hoping to have in the future is electronic health records. Um, that's a big undertaking, so we haven't quite gotten there yet, but that's something that we're hoping to do in the future. Great. Um, one last question. Um, have you seen any significant statewide education policy changes or adv advocacy for such changes based on your research using the data set? That's a great question. So one of the things, one of the goals for me um, with ABCD is is not just to answer scientific questions, but to have that science used for exactly that purpose, to change policy. Um, to date, I haven't seen any policy changes yet, but I have worked with various advocacy organizations to get the uh, science that we are producing into the hands of policymakers um, for just that purpose. So there have been papers that have looked at discrimination in schools, for example, or the benefit of Medicaid expansion. Um, those types of papers, we really want to get in the hands of policymakers to affect that change. I'll just add that we have a, um, a partnership with the Department of Education that we've created uh, for many years now, something called the Arts Education Partnership, which is a research and policy kind of group that does try to uh, champion uh, some of these policy issues, particularly around arts education and access uh, and enrollment in arts education. So I know they are aware of this 
data set and are excited about the prospects it might have for, uh, you know, bearing on some of their recommendations to policymakers. Great. John, did you have anything to add from the music perspective, music education perspective? Um, I'm with Gaia. I certainly hope that this will have uh, impact, but I think the, um, you know, the publications are still coming out. So I don't think there's been a definitive music and ABCD publication quite yet. Um, there's a lot of interest though in the interactions between music and, and mental health and music and substance use. So. This has been fascinating. Um, we are at the end of time. So I wanna thank you, all three of you again for participating, um, Sunil, Gaia and John. Um, this has been great. Um, the recording will be available on the NADAC website. And um, for people who are registered, um, you'll get that in a link. Anya, do you have anything else um, that I should be saying that I'm not, um, that you want to say to wrap up? Well, I also wanted to, to thank everyone, our presenters, and uh, all the participants that join us uh, today. Thank you so much. Uh, and if you would like to be part of uh, uh, other presentations like that that NADAC organizes, uh, please sign up uh, to receive our announcements on the website, NADAC website, and I think we have a link in the chat. So thank you, everyone, and uh, we hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank Bye. you all. Thank you.